So that's a pretty incredible plot arc, right? You start off with Christmas lights and it leads you yeah. to one place that leads to another that leads to another. It makes me think about the, the whole issue, if you like, about how strategic should we really be mm. about the way we develop research careers right, and the interests that we follow, or is it really actually about following your, your gut instinct yeah, yeah. and where that leads you? It's kind of interesting. I mean, I always advise all my, my PhD students, all my postgraduates, whatever you do, choose a topic that you're passionate and enthusiastic about. I think it's the absolute bottom line for me. It's kind of not really, and in a way, I suppose, oh, you know, I have been very strategic. I've, I suppose, you, finishing a PhD, I kind of did a little bit of work that followed on from the kind of tourist concerns there, but I was always kind of very interested in that. But I've always been sidetracked. And in some ways, it, it's meant that I haven't kind of followed certain projects through to the, the, with perhaps the fullness that I would like to have done, but then something else has kind of distracted me and I found more exciting. Mm -hmm. So the really good example of this is I did this work on national identity, which has been kind of quite influential, really. probably the most influential thing I've I've, I've kind of written, but uh, nobody ever invites me to conferences to talk about it or to seminars. I don't know why that is. I've no idea why that is, even though it's kind of the most cited uh, work. And I kind of left that because I got very excited by ind the Industrial Ruins project that I did. And I kind of feel like I'd like to go back that, to that at some point, but I do feel I kind of left that. But, you know, I think you've just got to be swayed by your enthusiasm. I mean, the, the, the whole thing, and I suppose coming late to academia, what I kind of do realise is that this is an absolutely amazing job to, to teach about and think about and write about things that you're really interested in. And so I suppose, that, and it's part of the reason that I publish quite a lot, is that I'm always excited by, by what I'm looking at. It kind of seems to be the absolute, you know, the bottom line that you've got to be into. Doing something instrumentally isn't, would make the job quite tedious, I should think. <laughs> So you mentioned industrial ruins. Mm. Do you want to tell us a story or two about industrial ruins? I mean, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, on top of my head, I'm thinking about yeah. the Bradley Garrett case, for yes, instance, which yeah, is getting discussed yeah, quite a lot yeah, in yeah. the social media mm. world and the whole issue about urban explorers mm. and danger in the doing of research mm. and industrial ruins. You well, so, uh, yes, I, uh, so this is something I've always done. It's, I've always liked going around old derelict properties, right? Ever since I was a kid, it's something I've always liked doing. And I always have done it, and then suddenly I realised about uh, 2002 is this intersects quite nicely with uh, some of the academic interests that I have. So I, it, didn't, it wasn't a kind of project that I kind of conjured up out of thin air, it was something that I'd always done. And so then uh, I started to go around far more industrial rooms. I got a little grant from the British government to tr for accommodation and petrol money and drove all around the UK. And in, in, in t from 2002 to 2004, I did this. And I guess there were really literally thousands of industrial ruins. There was this kind of second wave of deindustrialization across Britain after the kind of Thatcher era. And in nearly every industrial town or every industrial town, you could find heaps of ruins. I mean, uh, old mills, warehouses, you know, factories of all kinds of, uh, all descriptions. And they were quite easy to find. And uh, I became very addicted to this and I went into lots of different factories and, and took lots of photographs and you can see fo these photographs on the websites that I've got on this theme. Um, and what, what was, what's really interesting about this is, first of all, they were nearly all accessible, uh, even though nearly every factory on the, on the outside said, trespassers will be prosecuted, fierce dogs inside, big men inside who will sort you out but there was none of that at all right there never was anybody inside and if there were men inside guards they were so happy to talk to someone they were so bored stiff <laughs> so they'd be great they'd be really happy you know to have a conversation with somebody walking around so the, and the reason you could always get into these ruins even if they had kind of quite extensive uh, fencing around the outskirts is that local kids would always have got in Right, they'd always find a way, they'll kind of break a door off its hinges or burrow underneath some fence. So if you, if you, if you look around the property, you'll nearly always be able to get in. And, and so you could, they were always accessible and nothing happened, right? In terms of my, in terms of legally, nothing happened. No one ever chased me out. There was none of that. Uh, and it, what's kind of interesting about this is that also people talk about them as extremely dangerous spaces, right? Because I mean, after all, they're kind of places that are falling apart with, with unsafe floors and so forth. So, but, but of course, after you've been in a few of these places, you gain a sense of where to walk and what not to walk. You, you begin to sense what's dangerous and what's not, what stairs to go up, what steps uh, you should avoid. 
uh, what parts of the building it seemed dangerous. And, and so uh, in all the time that I went around the, these industrial rooms, I had no physical accidents, uh, accidents at all. Two things happened though that were, that were kind of slightly disturbing. The first was a, a, a ruin that I'd heard about, a kind of legendary ruin in South Wales, was this huge modernist concrete um, rubber factory, enormous, which had been, become derelict, all made, made of concrete and it had these huge circular skylights and uh, there was no one around, so I thought. And I walked in, went into this huge area, enormous kind of area where production used to take place, poking around. And suddenly, a few little pebbles seemed to be coming down from the roof. And I thought, that's strange. Maybe things are just falling off the ceiling or something. And I moved around. Suddenly, these pebbles became bigger. And then I was near one of the skylights, and this huge clump of masonry just landed right next to my feet. And I got freaked out. And I suddenly realised there was a gang of four kids on the roof, or five kids, I don't know, I never saw them. And I heard this pitter patter of feet on the roof, and they were trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was nothing I could do about it. I had to get out of the building. And I was trying to find a way where these skylights weren't, where they couldn't hit me. And it was a kind of a, you know, a kind of a, it became like some sort of sinister futuristic game, <laughs> as I had to kind of weave my way through the factory to escape these missiles from these youths and finally I got out and I just, there was no way, I had to give up the, I had to give up the, the photographing, I had to give up the visit and just go, go home and it was, it was kind of very uh, disappointing. And then the second thing that I, that I came across was uh, there was a big a place that I think made chains and there was a, this great big vat of oil where they used to put the chains through to grease them up. It was completely derelict uh, and I went in and I kind of climbed up to look into this um, vat and I saw what I thought was a dead child and I and you can imagine you know I've never I'd thought about these places not at all as sinister not at all I didn't have a kind of gothic imaginary that accompanied me at all I thought they were kind of quite interesting places all sorts of animals and then there seemed to be this dead kid in in the oil and I just thought I mean this is terrible what do I do you know this is just completely my heart started racing and I kind of moved along a little bit and it still seemed like there was this child there and then I got further and it was an inflatable alien and I don't think I've ever been so happy to see an inflatable alien <laughs> but how did it get there I don't know it's kind of very odd that this thing was there in the first place which kind of testifies to the kind of surrealism of ruins the fact that you get all sorts of strange juxtapositions you don't know how these things uh, uh, came about but those those are honestly the only two kind of alarming things that I, that I ever came across despite going into over 200 ruins, I should think. And so the stuff about the urban exploration, I, I kind of find it slightly strange, really. I mean, I never felt like I was being some sort of heroic guy going into these forbidden spaces. They seem to be very easy to get into. I thought there were all sorts of interesting things now, all sorts of different interesting sensations, kind of interesting aesthetics, interesting ghosts, sort of memories of the workers uh, who dwelt there. Um, and. I found them kind of quite friendly places, whereas urban explorers, they kind of seem to set themselves up as these, as these kind of daring individuals who go in, breaking the rules. You know, they take photographs and they, they present themselves as sort of pioneers in some way, which I isn't, I, so I wouldn't describe myself as an urban explorer. I just say I was a bloke who likes going to ruins. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that, um, you know, the way things are going though, that we're, we're erring on the side of being more cautious, more, mm -hmm. more safe with the way we design research, the way we're, we're meant to forward project the risks and account for those. I think, it's, I think it's a real problem. I think we do have to speculate about, I mean, I don't know what it's like here, but in the UK, we, you know, these sort of risk procedures are so extensive that you do wonder whether the kind of research that I did, if it was being done by a PhD, could, could actually take place at all. Uh, and so I think people are, are doing those, that kind of research, but they're lying effectively to get through the kind of risk panels, otherwise they just, they just simply wouldn't. And you, you know, you can think about all the kinds of things that, that you might, let's say you wanted to hang out with a bunch of graf graffiti writers, mm. you know, or a, or a gang, or something that was kind of, you know, a bit, a bit uh, you know, on the wrong side of the law, should we say. And there's, a, there's an honourable, drug users, you know, there's an honourable tradition of kind of social science research going in, going native, as it were, with these, with these people. I mean, how does the kind of contemporary research uh, risk strategy get, get around that? And the only way you can get around it is to, to tell many untruths, I think. Mm -hmm.